Welcome to the HIV podcast. Each week we focus on a person, historical event or pop culture moment linked to HIV and explore the story of what actually happened. I'm Sarah. And I'm Jess. And between us, we've been working in the field of HIV for 40 years. Our aim is to get as many people as possible HIV educated. Welcome to World AIDS Day. Hello. Oh, I've got my arms in the air. You can't actually see me yet, can you? No, no, because you're doing a big unveiling of your red ribbon creation. Yeah, I feel like you might be slightly disappointed. I don't think it's as big as you could make it, but I'm impressed by it. Are you ready? Yes. Be impressed even if you're not impressed. I'll try. Don't put a dampener on World AIDS Day. Okay. (laughs) What the hell is that? Do I look like Sue Pollard? It's actually a headband. And then I glued red ribbons to my glasses. That's commitment. Oh, with strategically placed ribbons. Well, I thought that afterwards, they're not supposed to be... I mean, we always forget that we're actually on the on, on a podcast and no one can see us. I basically have a big ribbon, like headband, and I've glued ribbons to my glasses. And I've also put two ribbons on my chest. But it's not supposed to be in that way. But I realise it sort of looks that way slightly. It does look like you've got nipple tassels, but, you know. How high are your nipples? Mine are definitely not up here. <laughs> But see where my ribbon is, yep. where my nipples are. <laughs> Just in the collarbone area. <laughs> How pert I am. <laughs> this is up, I'm afraid, because this is actually my old prescription. So now we've all seen them, they're coming off. That's why I was able to glue things to them. But the headband. Oh, well, I in. have I've got no creation. We've just talked about this, but mainly the reason I have no creation is because you're the doer out of the two of us. I'm more strategic, Jess. I really actually wanted to get you some like, you know, like the dealy boppers and put ribbons on them. How good would that have been? That would have been amazing. Right. Next year. OK, next year, I will prepare you a creation. So it can't just be one of us just red ribboned up. But... That's what we should do. Yes. We'll make them for each other. Well, I'm a bit scared about what you'd make me. I feel like it'd be a big penis hat made out of red ribbons. <laughs> <laughs> it would, wouldn't it? No, but I would come up. I know I'd come up with something good. I've got okay. ideas already. Well, next year, note them down, note them down. So, yeah, it's World AIDS Day. <laughs> yeah, you might have to say that again. That response from me was awful. <laughs> Yay! I know. Do you know, it feels a bit like Christmas. Whether you're supposed to celebrate it or not. We've always celebrated it, haven't we? We see it as a day of celebration. You know, remembering people is also celebrating them, I think. Or celebrating them is also remembering. They're, they're the same yeah. thing. Yeah, you know okay. So we're celebrating their lives. Yes, and how far we've come. Oh, I'll tell you what I did do before you start. I love it. You open your mouth and I'm like, no. So I did do a, a massive, little collage. A massive inhale and then you were like, me, my turn. <laughs> <laughs> I did a little collage of my favourite faces of, that you pull on the podcast. I'll send that over to you. I don't know if this is going to be like a nice collage or an awful oh. collage. I'm going to email it to you immediately. I think it's nice. Okay. Not really yeah. finished, but... I'm bored of doing it now. Right. While you're sending me that. Right. First things first. We have been asking for a while. Anyone that wants like a little shout out or to have their activities mentioned um, on the podcast World AIDS Day. Very special day. So first things first, Sarah, that is our first call of business. Okay. so I've got a bit of a list here. First of all, we're going to say a massive thank you to Outcast UK, who invited us to be on their podcast on World AIDS Day, on their World AIDS Day episode. Do make sure you go and check out their podcast. As always, with all of these things that I'm going to mention, we will tag them in things and put their links up so you'll be able to go and find them easily. So that's number one, okay? Oh, here it is. Here it is. You've sent it to me, have you? On yes. Word, Sarah. Oh, wow. Best stuff could come up with it short notice. Wow. And you've even put World AIDS Day 2022 with a ribbon on it. How creative. I'm actually going to share this because I can't lie to you. This is pitiful. This is a pitiful (laughs) design attempt. (laughs) This is terrible. It's why you do what you do and I do what I do. Exactly. Nextly, I just wanted to say really quick. Well, actually, both. Did you just say nextly? Did I say nextly? Did I? No, I didn't. (laughs) That's what it sounded like. Oh, do you know why? It's because on my paper it says firstly, but it's not first because there's something above it. So obviously I've gone to say next. And then God, nextly, just made made up a word there. Massive well done to everyone who took part in the Red Run. They raised, Sarah, a enormous, a huge £235,862 for 27 charities across the UK. 
Wow. Next up, TVPS. So obviously that's the charity that we work for when we're not doing the the HIV podcast. And um, TVPS have a virtual ribbon wall. So that's on their website, tvps.org.uk. And it actually runs all throughout the year. So if you ever want to send us a ribbon picture and you can put a little dedication with it, that stays up there all year. And then we add to it every World AIDS Day. And again, we're going to build and build it. So we have this beautiful, massive, big virtual red ribbon wall. And having it virtually just means that anyone can get involved, right? Anyone and everyone can, can send us. And if you need a ribbon, even if it's after World AIDS Day, that's fine. Just give us a shout. We'll post you one. Okay. Next up is IOTA Events, and they sent me a little quote. They're holding a World AIDS Day fundraiser with Quincy Young um, and IOTA Events, as I said. So it's an event that will put the fun in fundraiser with drag performances and games, whilst also raising awareness of the important issues faced by our community and raising vital funds for TVPS and Prepster. And that is at the Rising Sun Art Centre in Reading from 7 till 11 tonight. Good. I know. And we'll be there. We will be there. So do come along and say hello if you're in the Reading area. You'll spot us, of course. I probably won't be wearing this red ribbon headband, though. I might try and keep it together, but I think I might lose ribbons throughout the day. It's going to be a crazy (laughs) day. Next is from Be Prepped Lancashire. Today, they're having a coffee morning at Mardi Gras Blackpool. Um, When they sent that over, it was still to be confirmed. So I'm going to add it in because you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. We want we want to help as many people as possible. So today they're also having an afternoon remembrance event at Renaissance UK Dixon Road in Blackpool with a remembrance book and lighting of candles. They've got an evening at the Flying Handbag. I think it's the Flying Handbag. The Flying, Flying Handbag is that a pub? Fantastic name yeah. for a pub. It is a really good name. You know, I'm terrible at reading things. So this, I don't know why I thought this would be a good idea. We'll plough on. So that's in Blackpool with a raffle and live entertainment. And then buildings are going to be lit up for the Light It Red campaign. Blackpool Tower, Ashton Memorial, Preston Market, Marine Hall, Fleetwood. And I have put a a note, take some pictures and tag us so we can see. We'd love to see those buildings lit up. So please do let us know and we'll share them as well. And then there's Adorn the Common. And that's a World AIDS Day gala that's tonight from 6.30 till 10.30 at Burr House, New End Square in London, and that is in aid of Positive East. And I've got a couple of little shout outs to do. I'm nearly at the end of my list. A little shout out to Will, part of our little community. Lost Boys of Soho is his account for his absolutely amazing redo of the tombstone. I'm sure you've all seen it. We shared it on Instagram. If you haven't looked, please go and check it out. I feel like I'm going to print it out and get it framed and put it up. It's genius. Absolutely genius. I love it. I know. And he took the time to go and do that. So um, happy World AIDS Day, Will. And also, a little happy World AIDS Day shout out to Charlotte, who I know will be listening in her car. I hope she's not squealing. She squealed last time we gave her a shout out. On her way to work, happy World AIDS Day, Charlotte. There's my shout outs. That's it. Oh, can I add one to your list? So it's for Dr. Brett Palmer. You know Dr. Brett Palmer. So he is um, a sexual health doctor, sexual health consultant, and he has his own YouTube channel. It's Dr. Brett, B-R-E-T Palmer, and it's called The Explained Series. And it's short videos around all kinds of things. So he does one minute videos about things like herpes, syphilis, but he also does things like taste tests on condoms. And one of his episodes is also around how to remove semen stains from clothes. Remember in the episode about protection where you just kept saying you threw your condoms on the carpet? Perfect. Which I don't, but some people do. <laughs> Dr. Brett would be able to advise whether it would stay in the carpet or not. Fantastic. But yes, love Dr. Brett. Do go and check out his YouTube series. Again, we'll put the link below. And this segues quite nicely into something my mum mentioned. Bless her. She messaged me because she couldn't find where we put the sources. You know, we always say we'll put the sources below. We'll put the link so you can find them. So don't go onto Instagram to try and find them like my mum did, because you're not going to find the links there. We actually put them below the episode. So when you expand the episode, you'll see all the links below there. Mm. That's where you're going to find all of these different links. And obviously there's going to be a lot this week because we have so many. And as well as it being World AIDS Day, it's actually also Prep Awareness Week this week. So from the 29th of November to the 5th of December. And I've shared our protection episode because obviously we talked an awful lot about prep on that, didn't we? So if you're looking to get a bit more prep aware this week, definitely go and check that out and use the hashtag, hashtag get on prep. Get on prep. Yeah, that's the hashtag. Yeah. Let's see what they're saying. Yes, get on prep. And now before you begin, I have something else for you. I have something special. Yes. 
Yeah. Some, some good news. I'm going to send you something because I can't, unfortunately, when we're recording, I can't actually share my screen, which is quite annoying. So I've pre-prepared something that I'm going <gasps> to send to you. I know you're impressed with my preparation. All right, here you go. Send it over to your phone. Oh, to my phone. Oh, my yeah. goodness. So I've had to WhatsApp it, modern technology. I've got two messages. One's Only one's from me. May I present you, Sarah? Heath. Oh, in a sheath. look, it's Keith in a sheath. Oh, oh, I love that. That's, oh. very, that's very clever. The face. It's his little face, isn't it? Yes. This is very good. I asked my husband if he would mind calling his penis Keith. And because, you know, we've got to start somewhere. Yeah. And he said he um, he works for someone called Keith. So he said it'd be a bit weird because, you know, that's one of my work colleagues. So then I said, well, ask him, ask Keith, if he calls his penis little Keith. Could be big Keith, don't want to be derogatory. And he said to me, are you trying to get me the sack? And then we had a row. So excellent. <laughs> Amazing. Well, on that note, right, are you ready for this? So last episode, if you didn't listen, if you're just tuning in for the first time to our World AIDS Day extravaganza, welcome. But last week, Sarah came up with a fantastic campaign called Put Keith in a Sheath. So I have designed, she wanted me to design something first, so I've designed this. I will share this on our Instagram and our TikTok and everywhere. But um, what Sarah had also mentioned in the episode, I said to her that maybe she should check with our boss, Sean, if he'd be happy to call his penis Keith. He emailed me, everyone. He sent me an email regarding his penis. So, <laughs> no, it's so not sound sexual. It wasn't sexual. <laughs> So, <laughs> no, you've done it now. <laughs> so, I think you might be able to help me with this, Sarah. As Sarah said, encouraging everyone to put Keith in a sheath, which means that that sort of relies on a lot of people calling their penis Keith. But it would appear a lot of people already have names for their penis. Yeah. Sean, our boss, came back and said, I already call mine Boris for obvious reasons. What, like after Boris Johnson? So, I wondered this, right? And I was just thinking and thinking. And I actually Googled why someone might, because it seems so obvious. He said, obviously. So I thought, oh, maybe this is like a big thing that I've missed. So I Googled why someone might call their penis Boris. I came across a really interesting article. It's from the Metro in 2018. I will obviously cite the source. And it's from a Love Honey survey about penis names in the UK. Oh, my God. Yeah, go on. Right. So number one was Percy or Percy Pecker. Oh, that's not very original, is it? Yeah, number two was Fred. Number three was Bob or Bobby. Number four, we have Dickie. Yeah. As, as I would have hoped. Then we've got Billy the Willy. <laughs> oh, that's more like it. Alarmingly, we've got Jimmy Jimbo or Big Jim. And for anyone that doesn't know, my dog is called Jimbo. So I was like, oh, no. <laughs> oh, my God. So then we've got Pete the Pecker or One-Eyed Pete. Then there's Junior. And lastly, there's Big Boy. Oh, do you know what? We need to get in touch with Love Honey. I feel between this could be a good partnership. They can help us out with this. Yeah, maybe they can help us understand this. But I think you'll like this bit more. So it, it went on to say that other popular pet names that didn't make the top 10 included, get ready to have your childhood ruined, Thomas the Tank Engine. Why? Are you? Oh. Then Boris was on that list. Okay. On this list was also Postman Pat, Sherlock, Chewbacca, Willy Wonka, E.T. and Elvis. Do you know what? Why don't women have names for their vaginas? What are you going to call yours? I'm going for Audrey. Oh, Velma. (gasps) Velma and Audrey. I love it. There you go. It's another podcast series. (laughs) Velma and Audrey's views on the world. (laughs) I love it. Velma and Audrey. Do Dallas. So I even asked Ben. I said, what? uh, Have you heard this? What? penis boris and he was also confused but he did try to make an effort of working out by saying perhaps they mean boris the bellend you're calling sean a bellend i think we should move on jess because your your role your job role is hanging by a thread now just to be clear sean nobody called you a penis (laughs) and to be honest i'm spent now because that's more kind of news corner that's more everything corner well they say corner ribbon corner shout out corner penis corner than we've ever had. I know. Well, we can relax. No one will be listening now. It's gone on too long. I was about to just shut the episode down. Okay, thanks for joining us, everyone. Happy World Aids Day. Bye. Oh, yeah. Oh, shall we look at somebody? Shall we look at a hero? I would love to look at a hero this World Aids Day. And I'm glad you said that. I'm glad it's not some horrible moment in history that you're just going to get really angry about. 
No, no, it's definitely a hero. It's actually one of the longest survivors of HIV in the UK. I think I might know. Yes, he was diagnosed in 1982. So he was one of the first men in the country to be diagnosed. He was told at the time he had approximately six months to live. 40 years later, he has obviously proved them all wrong. We are featuring this week the lovely Jonathan Blake. That is an outstanding choice any day of the week, but especially for a World AIDS Day episode. Good work, Sarah. Don't you think he's like HIV royalty? Absolutely. I mean, he's featured in so many press articles, TV programmes, conferences. I mean, it's almost like I feel that we know him. We don't. I don't think we've ever met him. I don't want to frighten him if he listens to this episode. You know, when you've seen someone so much that you think, yes, I feel like I know who you are. That's the mark of a, a fantastic advocate. Them letting you in that much to feel that, to feel that familiarity from them. Also, can I just say as as an aside, I really wish we hadn't had that previous penis chat now about pet names of penises, because now I'm quite mortified in case Jonathan Blake does listen. So apologies. Oh, that's true, because I was going to say, let's be our most professional. That was ruined already, isn't it? Oh, here I am ruining your really lovely, amazing World AIDS Day episode with my foolishness. Never mind. Where do we start? Well, let's start with when he was diagnosed. So Dr. Jonathan's diagnosed in 1982. He was 33 years old and he's gone to the doctor because he's got swollen lymph nodes. Doctor thinks it's probably syphilis and they send him off to the local sexual health clinic. And he says they were all over me. They wanted to do a biopsy. So I had to stay there for two days. And in those days, if you were gay, you were put into a side ward so you wouldn't infect the other patients. It was crazy. That is crazy. Just for being gay, you're put in a completely different ward. Kid. Wouldn't happen now. You'd probably be put in a separate corridor. There are no beds left anywhere. Just awful, isn't it? Well, it's frightening. It's really frightening, I imagine. You've got enough going on anyway. And then to be sectioned off, it's Mm. awful. He said they came back and they said, you have a virus called HTLV3. Of course, this was before they'd actually named it. There's nothing we can give you to help. There'll be palliative care when the time comes and you have about six months to live. And that was that. They said I could go home and they just let him leave. And he said, I'm absolutely winded by this. I went home and I shut the door. Imagine. I mean, that would not happen now, would it, with with any kind of situation? But back then, oh, that's horrendous. But you wouldn't give some, any other terminal diagnosis. You wouldn't just say, right, here you go. See you later. I mean, I'm hoping you wouldn't. Anyway, I have to say, I don't really know the ins and outs of medical care in the 80s. But I'm really hoping that wasn't a standard across the board. But yeah, that's horrendous. But then I suppose back then, and it's not making excuses for them at all. In fact, it it makes it worse in some ways. They don't even know how it's transmitted, do they? So I think they're just like infection control. We've got to get this person out of the hospital. We'll just send them home. I I don't know. I'm surmising and I could be completely wrong. But as he goes on to say, he was the sexual health clinic's first patient with the virus. And he possibly was the hospital's, one of the hospital's first patients as well. So you can only hope that their kind of diagnosis delivery and post-diagnosis support has improved with subsequent patients. Yeah. He says after his diagnosis, he shut himself away from the world. I didn't speak to anyone. I didn't tell anyone. It was really, really difficult. That's quite common, isn't it? When we did the Stephen Hart episode, he was saying the same thing. Shut himself away from the world. Just didn't want to know anymore. But imagine back in 1982, as you're saying, one of the first people to be diagnosed with HIV. There's no charities that you can go and chat to, I'm assuming. There's no peer support because if you're one of the first people you're one of the first people there's not others that you can go and chat with uh, about all of this or talk things through so I just genuinely can't imagine how isolating that would have been he says I also came to the realization that I met my virus that's an interesting way of putting it isn't it I like that. Yeah, I like that. I met my virus the year before while I was visiting San Francisco. I went to bathhouses there. And at the time, there was a kind of a sense of something in the air, but it wasn't really talked about. It's only later in the year, the news started talking about this strange disease that targets gay men. So by December, um, he's had enough. He's seriously thinking about taking his own life. He'd been speaking to friends in America and he just heard enough about what was happening to people over there. But he hears the voice of his mum. See, mums are always there, aren't they? And she's saying, you know, if you do that, you have to clean up your own mess. And he's like, well, if I 
commit suicide I won't be able to so he doesn't go through with it I mean imagine what a low place you'd be in I'm glad his mum was there so he said if you know if I can't kill myself I better just get on with it and start living he wants to be around people completely understand that so he's going off to pubs and bars but often standing in the shadows because he keeps thinking I've got this killer virus coursing through my veins I don't want to affect anybody else and he openly admits he's never been very good with condoms so it's difficult needs to be with people but not I can totally understand what he's saying there I don't know whether it was the shame but I just felt really awful and isolated and I didn't know how to manage it but there is a reason for telling you all of this Mm -hmm. and a reason for looking back at the start of his diagnosis and that is to give people hope because the feelings he describes are still common now so we still get asked don't we by people when they're newly diagnosed they're referred to us by the sexual health clinic and they'll say to us when am I going to die that's still quite common so for anyone in that position or anyone who's experiencing similar feelings to Jonathan at the time of his diagnosis just remember Jonathan has lived with HIV now for 40 years and you can too so I'm hoping that's what people take away from today is he's an excellent role model for people who are being diagnosed now we do see that all the time people it's the first thing how long have I got I feel like it's that and then they'll also be like oh no no don't hug me don't touch me So we, obviously we don't force ourselves on people, but if people would like a hug, we definitely very much encourage that because we want to, I know I just sounded like what I do is rugby tackle people with just a big bear hug when they come in. Is with consent that I would hug someone, but yeah, I think they're the two biggest things that we see. Don't touch me. When am I going to die? And it's easy for us at the drop in because we can introduce people to a long term diagnosed people. And it's a visible kind of reference then, isn't it? But I know we have people listening from all over the world who might not have a local support group. So this is our way of saying, yes, we see you. We understand what you're going through. Um, and so does Jonathan because he has lived with it for 40 years. Yes. And obviously we'll tag him. What a powerful choice for World Aid Day, actually to be able to show someone what this person was diagnosed in 1982. It's amazing, isn't it? So things start to turn around for Jonathan. He meets his partner, Nigel, and they move in together. And Nigel is an activist uh, and they met at a nuclear protest. Oh, see, we've got a lot in common, me and Jonathan Blake, because I spent a lot of my childhood at protests in London or at Greenham Common. I'm going to go out on a limb and assume this is with your mother. Yes, it was. Yes. yes. So there was a women's camp at Greenham Common and we used to go down there regularly to support them, which at the time I thought everyone was doing this. Now I realise most kids probably weren't. Good. Um, what's her name? I need to know her name. Mummy Mac. <laughs> That's not Mummy Mac. I get called. I know. My mum, oh, she's called Marion, but she doesn't listen to this. It's as much as I can get her to do to just use WhatsApp. Well, well done, Marion. Anyway, I think that's pretty blooming awesome. So Nigel and Jonathan decide to join LGSM. Lesbians and gays support the minors. We know yes! all about this. And if you watch Pride, the film that's about this, uh, which everybody will now know, has replaced Bridget Jones as my favourite film. The actor John, uh, Dominic West plays Jonathan in it. I love Dominic West as well. There you go. It's all coming together for you, isn't it? Yes. You've almost planned these few episodes, Sarah, because we went Mark Ashton, didn't we? And the minor strike, so Pride film. Then we went Jimmy Somerville. Then we went 80s AIDS campaign. And now with Jonathan Blake, which links to the 80s and also to Mark Ashton. Oh, wow. This is just, you're blowing my mind a bit. It's all linked. Let's pretend that was all supposed to happen. So Sean thinks we're amazing. Well done, Sarah. Brilliant job. And you, Jess. That, all that brainstorming, we've really nailed it. It's the headband that's probably going to impress him the most. <laughs> So Jonathan's doing all of this to divert his mind away from HIV, but he is volunteering at HIV drop-in centres. He's doing training courses, keeping busy. And of course, he has Nigel. He trains in pattern making and completes a qualification in tailoring and starts work as an assistant pattern cutter for the English National Opera. I think that's quite a cool job. Well, I think that's an awesome job. Imagine those costumes. During his interview for this job, he notices a letter on the wall from St Mary's Hospital thanking staff for the support they'd given to one of the pattern cutters who died of AIDS. And that's how he knows that job is for him because he says, yeah, they're going to understand when I fall ill. And that is how people living with HIV in the 80s had to think. You always had it in the back of your mind. You're not going to be around forever. And if I feel Ill, fall ill... How will that impact on the people around me? Amazing. So Jonathan's health starts to deteriorate. And in 1996, he's put on HIV medication. That came with side effects, in his case, neuropathy, which is damage to the nerve endings. 
He's been on several combinations since. Do you know, that's the good thing, isn't it, about HIV medication these days, the range of combinations. If one doesn't work for you, there are lots of other options. But of course, in the early days, there was only kind of one or two options. No, and obviously they came with quite severe side effects. So now, Jonathan, well, he's done so many things. We can't feature all of them because we'd be here for days. So we're going to focus on his views on different aspects of HIV, because I think it will give you a real sense of his character. In the late 80s, the AZT trial was introduced and it was offered to Jonathan, actually, and he declines because he knows it's a powerful drug with lots of side effects. And he's seen other men die during the trial. And this actually is very similar to one of our service users who passed away a few years ago because he was offered a place in the trial and he saw the effect it was having on others. And I remember him reminiscing about it, saying, well, I don't see the point because either way you're going to die. So it's like weighing up the lesser of two evils. And he lived for another, well, it must have been at least 30 years after the trial, but such a hard decision. But Jonathan had this to say about the trial. And we've never really looked at how the trial has operated. So this gives us a little bit of an insight. So he said he felt furious. Um, He's talking about the Concord trial, it was called, and he declined to take part. So he says a cohort of HIV patients was split. Half took AZD and the other half were given a placebo. And he said, look, I just asked the question and said, are you going to match me up with someone of a similar metabolism or build so that either I get the pill and they get the placebo or vice versa? So in other words, are you going to compare like for like or not? And they said, clinical trial people no that that, that's just too complicated so he said to them well if you can't be bothered to run a proper trial I can't be bothered to be in it and I like that attitude I do he's got a point hell yeah this is my health this is my life and you can't even be asked to match me up I'm sure it's more than them not being asked but yes it feels like that yeah no it really does so I, I like that. And, and he's very knowledgeable, as as most people kind of living with HIV are. He knew that AZT was a toxic drug anyway, a failed chemotherapy drug. And he said, you know, that's what made me so angry. They knew that it, it didn't work for, for chemotherapy and they're trying to palm it off onto us. And also it was wiping out the immune system, which HIV and AIDS was doing anyway, um, leaving people open to infection. So he's just like, no, I'm having none of this. And he said, you know, that anger, that's what kept me going. Um, so, I mean, he's very of passionate and he and makes a good point there and I think that probably does go a long way towards somebody being determined to kind of manage this and live with it. it I think passion and anger are very very close it's that fire yeah. burning in you that that keeps you going right well most definitely with him yes right his views on you equals you so he said when I was diagnosed in the early days I felt like I was a modern day leper who was going to want to know me My libido was on the floor. I wanted to have sex, but I didn't want to have sex because I didn't want to infect anyone. So to have this notion that if you are on treatment and undetectable, you cannot pass that virus is psychologically incredible. Of course it is. I'm going to use that as a soundbite. Yes, exactly. It's you equals you is incredible. Yeah. And he sums it up perfectly. The Don't Die of Ignorance campaign. I thought I would get away with not mentioning it for one episode, but no. We featured the leaflet for it last week. So, yes, it's this is so interwoven with the last few episodes. He says it instilled fear rather than give information. Yes, Jonathan, I agree. He says the right wing press vilified gay men as though we were just the devils that were going to wipe out civilization. It was appalling what they did to us and the way we were treated and the way HIV positive people were treated. Totally agree. Yeah, absolutely. And exactly why we covered it, because half the problem is that we still remember these adverts and they still terrify everyone. And really, that's the one thing we can all cite, isn't it? Someone mentions HIV or AIDS. We're all thinking about the tombstone. That's why it needs to be changed. It does indeed. And if Jonathan Blake feels that he's not happy with it, I'm right beside him. His new best friend. Yeah. Self-appointed. He hasn't hasn't had any say in this whatsoever. You're just declaring this. Yeah, no, I am. Definitely. LGBT rights. So he has always been a gay rights activist, first and foremost. He said we made remarkable strides, but they could be wiped out if we're not on our guard. People are always out to get us. The right wing is is right there waiting. So, I mean, yes, he's quite political and he's clearly (laughs) doesn't hold the right wing in very high esteem. But he also makes a good point because he says the young LGBTQ plus people should know about their community's history and, and understand where the rights that they have now have come from. Because if you know how hard people fought to get to this point, you're going to value those rights a lot more than if you don't. And and I think you'll fight harder and be more aware if those rights are being threatened. 
you'll be more on guard and alert if you realise how hard it was fought for to get those in the first place, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so he makes another good point there. I think there were two things to note. As we said, he's been in so many things. So two things I pulled out. One is the um, series, The NHS at 70, where they look back over the lifetime of the NHS. He speaks on there about being diagnosed, reflecting on how NHS care in the early days of HIV and attitudes towards gay men, how it was at that time, because it's very different to how it was now. Um, He's also appeared in the HIV monologues. So that's a play and book written by Patrick Cash, another person, actually, who's well known in the HIV community. And the monologues feature five different characters in four different scenarios. And he played the character of Barney. And he was uh, in the review. It says he's a force of nature on the stage and is utterly compelling. So he's a pattern cutting. He's an activist. He's public speaker and an actor. Well, no wonder you want to be his best friend, Sarah. I do too now. Oh, but I think, you know, I mean, he's obviously one of these people that achieves in everything he does. <laughs> so it would be quite demoralising to be like, I just work at a charity. Really accomplished, isn't he? He's got his own Wikipedia page, of course. That is no mean feat to get a Wikipedia page. That is difficult. Oh, well, they say that his legacy, he extensively discussed his experiences of attitudes towards sexual health and homosexuality during the 1970s. He speaks openly about living with HIV and the struggles it entails and fights against the stigmatisation of the illness. He's volunteered at various HIV drop-in centres, including the Landmark, Lighthouse South, THT and the Food Chain. He was the face of THT's first Safer Sex poster aimed at gay men and took part in the HIV monologues. He is a champion of U equals U and a commentator on current LGBTQ plus rights issues. I mean, he must be one of the busiest people in the HIV sector. And what an HIV hero. He really is. And, you know, he's very open. He speaks very openly about lots of different issues. I mean, there's a few things that I think he would like that I don't think I know because I researched him that he would like to see in the future. And one of those is that more people speak out openly about living with HIV. That's a big ask. As we know, most people still find it very difficult to speak openly about living with HIV. But he'd like to see that because he's saying that will reduce the stigma, which is true. Absolutely. I mean, our client base of around seven to eight hundred ish people, we have one who's happy to um, sort of forego that anonymity and speak completely openly. And that sort of shows you, doesn't you, how rare that still is. But it takes people like Jonathan Blake to speak openly. And I, I think it really does encourage other people. We see how people being open about their status has such a positive effect on our service users. It really, really does. So one day I hope, yeah, there will be lots more people that are happy to be open, but I can understand why people are fearful. There is a lot of stigma. Yeah, I know there is definitely. The other thing you'd like to see is the AIDS epidemic included in the school curriculum. He's right about that. It should be, it's part of our history. Yeah, the big part, actually, a really big part. And it's just not covered at all. Absolute madness. And he also acknowledges the power of community. Well, I mean, he's an activist, so he knows what he's talking about. Gay men, lesbians, straight allies, uh, who he says, you know, look, they set up THT and the body positive groups. And TVPS started out as a body positive group. So he's right there. And he would like to everyone to have a big push to 2030. So he's talking about the goal of zero HIV transmissions in the UK by then. So he says we need to make sure HIV is never manageable. Manageable is never enough. We need to eradicate. Again, you can't argue. He's absolutely bang on the money with that. And finally, his, his advice to everyone. Now we've established that he um, is HIV royalty. He says, know your status and don't be afraid. Got the medication available. And if you're diagnosed with HIV today, it's not a death sentence anymore. You've only got one life. You just have to go for it. Oh, love that. Absolutely love that. Happy World AIDS Day, everyone. What a lovely, yes, a lovely quote for World AIDS Day 2022. So there you go. That is everything we need to know about Jonathan Blake. That was awesome. It's really nice to know a bit more about his history. Like you say, I know his face. I've seen him well. I know some of his story, but what? I just said I know him well. I don't. I mean, as in from seeing him on, on things, not personally. But yeah, what a fantastic, fantastic person. And I'm really glad you featured them because actually I think his story will help an awful lot of people. Amazing. All done now. It's time for a cup of tea, Jess. Well, no, it's going to be a busy old day today. have got a million events <laughs> to go and do. So there's no sitting down, Sarah. There's no sitting down. There's no cups of teas. We're straight off. We're going to, yeah, there's a ton more things to do. 
I know, but let's not ruin the habit. I mean, I've trained you to make the tea, so you just have to do it, okay? (laughs) Just got to go and do it. Well, make sure, everyone, you are wearing your ribbon all day because I just wanted to say it's really important to... Of course, of course my dogs are going to ruin it. Oh, they want to be a part of it too. (laughs) Just hates me today. Just every time I breathe in to speak, he's like... Um, Anyway, I was just going to say, I'm going to fight through it. I'm going to fight through the Jimbo, everyone. Um, It's just really important to wear the ribbon. You never know who um, might see you wearing it, who's also positive, that sees that you're supporting people affected by HIV. So please do wear your ribbons and ignore Jimbo. Very well said. Yes, I totally agree. Only with the ignoring Jimbo bit, right? (laughs) Yes. Yes. Oh, bless him. We can't hang around, Sarah. It's go, go, go today. So we hope that everyone has the most amazing World AIDS Day. And please tag us in your events, your activities, your stories, your posts. We will share as much as we can. Oh, and we also wanted to let you guys know that when you message us, you are actually talking to us. So it's me that answers your messages. So you're coming, you have a little direct line straight through to us. So when someone replies, it's usually me. So please get in touch with us and um, yeah, just keep sharing your events and things. Anything to add, Sarah? No. Oh, I thought you were summing up. Oh, I know I am. <laughs> I thought you were going like, to do like a quip at the end. No. What an amazing ending. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to the HIV podcast. If you enjoyed our podcast, please like, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can now also follow us on Instagram and TikTok at the HIV podcast for behind the scenes insights and videos.